All right, here we go. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Didn't quite time the music well this week, but that's okay. Hope you had a terrific week. We did over here, and we're excited that you joined us. And what is this doing up here? What is that doing there? Family Guy. Why is the Family Guy on my screen? All right, stay tuned for one second because my desktop went a little bit crazy here, and everything that I had planned. There we go. Okay. Um, there we go again. All right, so this week in SFR, very happy that you joined us. It's been an exciting week here at Own America. Um, I've got some interesting things to share with you that developed um, throughout the week here and kind of brings um, a really what I think is one of the most exciting things about this sector um, kind of to the table, and that is this concept of strategy diversity that we have uh, for many years now um, expected there to be a divergence of strategy because the uh, the industry was pretty myopic okay there were 10 cities you know you can name them you know Charlotte Atlanta Jacksonville Orlando Tampa uh, Dallas Houston Phoenix that there was a, a dozen cities that made up the base of the institutional SFR business which gave birth to the overall SFR although it's been around since the 1600s it had never really been professionalized the way that it has in the last few years and so um, very exciting wind at our back, a lot of opportunity for business operators and uh, investors, entrepreneurs to do really, really well because of this wave, this gravitational pull of consolidation taking place and professionalization taking place in this asset class. But the strategies are kind of myopic and, and what we always expected is that um, there would be new ideas that would come along, right? The idea that that gave rise to this trend was the American economy is in the tank, the American housing market is in the tank for the first time, really for the first time. You look at the long-term charts and these other real estate crashes they talk about in uh, the last 50 years didn't really happen from the standpoint of home prices. It did happen. Um, the big deep correction took place back a few years ago. Um, that was real and it attracted a lot of people that basically said this is going to recover. This is the U.S. housing market. Population is not shrinking. Population is the core of housing demand for both value and rent, so yield and depreciation. And so they dove in. And uh, they dove into the same places, buying basically the same things, doing it basically the same way. Um, they assembled their infrastructure and eventually brought all their property management, maintenance, and everything in-house. They bought the same types of houses on the newer side. That was kind of the, the strategy of the industry. And we often said here that these guys and gals are hacking their way through a dense jungle. Um, nobody's been to the other side yet and they're hacking their way through and it's brutal but the rewards of being there first are great um, and once they cut through they've cut through and they were going to then have a trail and that trail was going to get pounded on by other people and then eventually it was going to be a smooth freeway and a lot of people were then going to have the benefit A of having a smooth ride through complete with exit ramps and hotels and <laughs> gas stations and quickie marts and fast food. I mean, all the, all the, all the trimmings uh, to make that a pleasant ride through. Um, and, uh, and the benefit of having the knowledge that's on the other side, the people who went through this jungle last, they survived and they thrived. And the, the proof of what they were able to achieve, honestly, the proof that most people, not most, virtually everybody understood the housing market was a good investment. We've all got relatives, uncles, and somebody, maybe yourself, maybe your own family, who bought rental houses, rented them out, made money, retired with more income or retired with more wealth because the houses had been paid off and, and had appreciated. And they understood all this. The thing was that nobody really measured it before. You ask the average investor in the year 2000 what their yield was, they would think you were talking about a triangular sign at the corner. They didn't talk about yield. They didn't measure yield. They didn't know what the, in, the industry yielded. They didn't know what the asset yielded. Uh, they just knew that the rent checks came in and the house got more, more valuable, and that was all good. Now we know what yield is uh, because we've measured it across the entire country, all kinds of places, all kinds of houses. So that, that new highway coming through, the trend is not discounted homes in a down market because it isn't a down market. It's a recovered market now. 
And so people have to figure out how to get a little bit more blood from the stone, right? How do you do, how do you invest a little bit more, um, I shouldn't say intelligently, how, how do you find your own angle? How do you find your own twist, right? Strategy diversity. And so if you, if you look at other industries, for example, multifamily, right? When multifamily first emerged, it was apartment buildings, garden apartments, that was it. And then the trends became very hot and heavy on diverse strategies of, of uh, multifamily. So luxury apartments was one. Downtown gentrification, conversions was another. Uh, 55 and older, which used to sound like senior housing to me. Now it sounds like in a couple of years to me. Um, but senior housing, 55 and older housing, uh, student housing. Uh, a good friend of mine's son just got into this sort of communal housing where it's almost like a dorm. There's massive uh, massive. There's there's very large common space, dining rooms, family rooms, theater rooms, and the apartments are tiny and they're basically bedrooms and bathrooms, small, uh, that don't have the living space. The living space is shared. That's now taking hold in um, major metro areas, New York specifically. So strategy diversity, right? And we had the same thing in the stock business, right? So you you look at what's happening in the world and you try to figure out where is the path going to go. Where the, where, what, which harbor is going to get a lift where the boats are going to rise a little faster than others. And it's easy to think about in the stock market. People do this intuitively there. And as an example, Adam and I spoke um, about this before the election last year and said, okay, if it goes one way, who's going to get the lift? What sectors, what companies, what businesses are going to get the lift if it goes one way? If it goes the other way, who's going to get the lift in that situation? And we made a list, and we did a little bit of research, not a lot. Uh, and as soon as the election came through um, and was decided, we bought stock in the companies that we had identified as being likely to get some wind under their sail. Um, and I'll just give you an example, because they, they all worked out. Now, everybody's a genius in the stock market these days. I get that. I mean, everything's doing pretty well. But we're doing a little better than normal. And um, this was one of the things that we seized upon that he had talked about of course, he won, and so he had talked prior to that about the slow pace of uh, approvals for drugs in the FDA. And so we went and looked for companies that had drugs that were stuck in that queue, um, drugs that were in big areas. So one was an ADD drug, one was a breast cancer drug. We bought companies that had those things passed in, in the queue, and they've popped ever since. Um, you read the shifting plates of earth, you make a play. Another one was... We bought stock in the company that, uh, I don't say we, this was me, I'm not sure if he did it, the Keystone Pipeline. He said he was going to open the pipeline. As soon as he got elected, we bought stock in the pipeline company. Pipeline company's doing pretty well, and he did, in fact, approve it. So now the question is, this is on CNN, so someplace in this article they talk about how he eats babies for lunch, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> uh, the, um, the issue then becomes what's happening in the country where there's going to be a lift. Because one of the things that you're trying to do here is figure out where the people are going. Where the people are going, they're going to want to live indoors, right? It sounds silly, but it's noteworthy. People want to live indoors. If they have kids and dogs, they want to live in houses. Therefore, if a place is attracting population, then it's going to be a good place to invest if the reasons why it's attracting the population are going to continue. Now, this little map right here, you're going to love. Um, Forbes put this out. It is old, okay? It's outdated. It has not been updated since 2012. But it's cool enough that it's still worth showing because migration patterns, they don't change on a dime. So even though it's a few years old, it's still useful. So you go in here and you pick any market in the country that you want, any county, and you can see where people are coming from and where they're going to. So like I'm here in Mecklenburg County or close to it, Charlotte. And the blue lines here are people coming in, and the red lines are people going out. This is based upon IRS data. Turns out the IRS tracks where you're going. Doesn't surprise me. Um, as of 2012, you can see Charlotte, North Carolina is sucking population out of the Northeast. It's pulling people out of Chicago and Detroit, pulling people out of Southern California, and even out of Florida. You might have heard the trend they call halfbacks. People who left New York, went to Florida. Too many more New Yorkers came to Florida, and so they came halfway back to the Carolinas. You can bounce around the country and see, um, <clears throat> like, here's a fun thing to do. So everybody seems to be coming in, but they're going out to a few places. Where is this? This is um, Travis County, Austin. 
<clears throat> so people leaving Charlotte to go to Austin. See how Austin performs. Look at that. It's like all blue. Get out of there. All blue. Right? Places where there's massive migration coming in are going to be places where real estate's going to do well. But it's not everywhere. You know, I mean, Los Angeles has a, a problem. I think the New Yorkers are scaring away the Californians if this chart means anything to you. And you go into other places like Detroit um, and some places where there's a lot of outbound. But the point is, you read the tea leaves on what the people are doing, right? The beauty of SFR is that it is common sense. Uh, it starts off with choosing the market, and then you pick the asset in the market. But I've always contended that if you go buy a market-priced house in a decent neighborhood or a decent school district, and you get market rent for it, and you get, you're going to get the yield the market bears. There's a lot of people out there that have money they want to spend on real estate, but they want to get a deal that's just a little bit too hard to get, and they can't deploy their capital. The folks who actually figure out, let me raise the capital based upon what the market provides so that when I have the capital, I can just deploy it. Okay, If I'm running a fund, the more money I have under management, the more wealth I create for everybody, especially myself. So create strategies that allow you to deploy the capital by buying what the market bears. But what I wanted to do here is highlight two markets. I'm going to do this each week. Highlight two places where we, we have some property for sale. So I can show you the analysis and show you the fundamentals and tell you what we like about that portfolio, not because you're going to buy it, but because it illustrates the way at least one company who's hip deep in this industry does it. And we get a fair amount of attention and, um, and appreciation for our approach to telling the story. How do we tell the story about the market? And so the first thing we got, the reason why I'm doing it like this today is because this week we got contacted by two new clients. Or we hope they become clients that are buying. Okay, one uh, wants to buy 2,000 houses. They're interested in off the beaten track markets, strategy diversity. Right, they're not going to Atlanta and Charlotte and Nashville and Tampa. They want to talk about things like Gainesville and Tallahassee and Savannah and um, Chattanooga. Right, places that are towns you've heard of, towns that people live in towns that are doing well, they have job growth and everything else, but their angle is not as much competition. It's a lot to be said for that, right? When you buy in a, in, a, in a crowded place where a lot of large investors have already bought thousands of houses, mostly vacant, and then added them to the rental stock, right? When you buy a vacant home, not only are you guessing at the rent, educated or not, you're guessing at it, and not only are you hoping you know what it's gonna to cost to renovate it, how long it's gonna take, but you also are adding one more unit of supply. You're increasing the competition for the tenants. Just another reason why buying occupied properties makes more sense. Rent on day one, income on day one, no renovation needed to collect the rent because they're already living there and you're basically taking a piece of supply and bringing it over to your column, but you're not adding competition for you and everybody else. So this client was talking about strategy diversity from the standpoint of secondary and tertiary markets and their angle was less competition means we have a chance to be the largest landlord in town. If you're going to buy 2,000 houses, there are places that if you buy 500 homes, you are the big dog. And when you're the big dog, you have um, certain advantages, right? When you're number one, you have advantages. It's like, you know, picture 10 people having a sword fight on a hill. The person on the top of the hill who's highest up is fighting a different fight than everybody else. He's protecting his ankles, they're protecting their necks. So um, that's the first story, strategy diversity. The second one, which I thought was great, was right along the lines of trying to read political movement and policy movement out of Washington and figure out what that means for business. And what they landed on was Western PA. Western PA does, is part of what they would call the Rust Belt, right? People talk about the Rust Belt. But it's gone through a complete resurgence over the last several years. And um, aside from manufacturing getting exciting again in this country, they have repurposed a lot of their factories already. But that's not why they're going there. They're going there based on a trend that I have long expected to see people jump all over, which was shale, energy, okay, fracking. Western Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania is pro-fracking. Western PA is all about it. And now the federal government's not going to get in the way and probably not going to let anybody else get in the way. Just across the border in New York, in Rochester, they have the same shale, but they can't get at it because the state government's not on board. So Western PA um, is a, uh, we've thought this for a long time. We've always been bullish on Pittsburgh. 
part of that, by the way, was because we went there and I spoke to an audience of real estate brokers who were becoming investment specialists by virtue of taking the course that I was offering. This is back in 2010, 2011. And um, I asked them, which I always did, because I can look at all the charts and graphs in the world, but I want to hear from the people. Why do you like it here? Why did you come? Or if you were born here, why do you stay? And um, so I asked them, what's, what's so great about this place that you guys all stay here? And they all basically said in unison, well, football, <laughs> right? Pride in their city is what that translated into. Uh, but now they've got this big business moving in, a lot of new jobs coming in, and a lot of support for shale fracking in terms of the, the devices they use, the equipment they use, the um, so those smaller factories that are scattered around Western PA that were making auto components uh, are now being repurposed to make fracking components, and they're being filled up. So uh, that was another diverse strategy that we just heard about this week that caused me to want to talk about it with you today. Um, manufacturing overall is one of the big stories that's happening out there right now. You you know, th this is not a um, pro-Trump, anti-Trump conversation at all. It's just you read what it is that they are doing and you can identify opportunities that are going to come out of it. One of the things that I see clear as a bell is that if you want to get favor from this government, you bring jobs back and you give the president a chance to take credit for it. Okay? So you don't have to love him or hate him to agree with that statement, right? So he likes press conferences where he gets to announce that this CEO who's a great guy who I just turned I just muscled him over and he is going to open up or keep a factory here. He's going to keep jobs here. And when the cameras go off, we're going to make a deal to give him a tax cut or we're going to make him a deal to give him a government government contract. Right? You don't grease this administration by writing checks to campaigns, you grease this administration by giving him press conferences to hold where he can take credit for something good that's happening with respect to jobs. So there's a lot of that going on. And I was tracking the announcements of, uh, of the auto industry because that was a big one. You know, when they, they jumped right on the bandwagon to say, no, 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 we're not moving our factory overseas. We're not doing that. We're doing it here. And they made a number of announcements, and those announcements were, um, are being followed through on. And so we went and um, created this little graphic for a client who was thinking about going into Detroit because I, frankly, was a little bit worried about Detroit for a long time, partially because when you go into – where's Detroit? Is this it? Yeah, okay. So that was the story in Detroit for a long time. It was the only – Michigan was the only state in the country that had a net negative in terms of migration. There were more people leaving that were coming in. Population was declining. That's terrifying when it comes to real estate investing, obviously. Um, but there were two things that were going on there. Okay, one is that the bankrupt city was um, taken over by an emergency manager appointed by the governor and went through bankruptcy. And we were watching it very closely because there was going to be a point of no return, right? There was going to be a point at which it went from being bankrupt to being at least on its way to solvency because they had renegotiated whatever pension uh, obligations they had, they had dealt with renegotiating whatever bonds they owed money on, whatever they did was then done and it was going to come out the other end because it is still a city in America and so it should not be in decline forever. And that did take place. The bankruptcy took place, it came out the other end of that process um, and we began to get a little more bullish on it because at that point the prices were already baked in. I mean, you could trade in your Escalade and buy five houses in Detroit, okay? So it was, it was definitely priced into the market. The question was, were those $10,000 houses worth five, or were they going to be worth 25? You know, houses don't double in value, but when they're that cheap, they potentially can and very quickly. And so this is the angle that we um, – this is the point at which we said, okay, now is the time. The prices have already begun elevating. In the market, a lot of capital has gone in and taken those blighted neighborhoods and just started buying things and renovating them, buying them and renovating them, and outnumbering the blighted houses with new renovated houses, newly renovated houses. And we have a portfolio there. You see it on this map right here because I identified the five factory announcements between GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Um, there are tons of other manufacturing opportunities coming up from companies you never heard of before. But the big three automakers all, you know, jumped in front of each other to be able to give the president that press conference. 
and say they're going to open. And so we wanted to see where on the map the jobs were going to be and where the houses in our portfolio were. And that portfolio is right here. We've got a $4.6 million portfolio. It's yielding 11.6%. Okay, the average prices on these houses, 50 grand, 45 grand, right? And they're not bad. I mean, these are, these are nice looking little houses and neighborhoods that have gone through the other end of the pipeline. They're nicely clustered in two different parts of town. But what I want to show you is if you go down, you may never have seen this because if you go down below the pictures of the house, below the maps, below the calculator, and you get the asset quality report. This is the market fundamentals section of our analysis. And this is actually where we begin. We just happen to do it secondary on the website because people usually want to look at the property first when they're evaluating. But when you come down here, the first chart you come to is the long-term price performance. All right, we have a very simple uh, philosophy here about home price appreciation. And it isn't, you can't count on it. All right, I've heard some very smart people say that, and I want to throw up every time I hear it. We're only buying yield. You can't count on appreciation. Well, that's wrong. That's incorrect. You can count on appreciation if you buy it in the right place and hold it for long enough. The only time in history that this market actually went down was between 2007 and 2012. That was it. If I showed you the 40-year chart on this, you would see a steady curve through all these real estate crashes that never actually happened. You know, I, by the way, there is a reason why people say there was a real estate crash. It's the real estate industry who stopped selling houses in the early 1980s and then stopped selling houses again in the late 80s and early 90s. And they talk about it as this bloodshed, you know, 18% interest rates in 81 and the, the, the crash of the market in, in, uh, in 89 and 90 didn't make a blip on the chart. Okay, it just didn't. So they may have made less money in the real estate business in terms of the realtors, and they may have, National Association of Realtors might talk about these housing crashes, but their own data says there wasn't one until here, and we know why. But why this chart is interesting is, number one, if you track the trajectory back when the market was boring in 96, 97, all the way through 2001, before it went haywire, it kind of gives you a line that you can kind of stretch out. And say that you know this this paints a picture of a market that was messed with, right? Human intervention, self-inflicted wound. It was messed with. It artificially elevated prices. The market woke up like a grizzly bear, mauled everybody in sight, and then went back to sleep again. And the market has gone back to recovery. And I love this last year right here because it it ended up finishing right where the same trajectory that I think it would have started, it would have gone to, actually not quite, okay, so if we follow the line all the way across, we're still got, we have a little bit more to go to catch up to the trend line, and we're going to look at this thing years from now and see this weird little zit on the chart, remember what that was, and you're going to see calm, you're going to see a storm, and then you're going to see calm again, and hopefully we never repeat the mistakes, but the reason why we overlay the market and the state is that you can draw conclusions, so look at what happened in, in Michigan. Okay, Michigan was going okay, kind of had a bit of a dip, is recovering, but a much more boring market, not as volatile, but look at the county of Wayne County, Michigan. Okay, the average appreciation going back 20 years is one-tenth of 1%. It hasn't appreciated. Okay, so you're buying houses today for about the price you could have gotten them 20 years ago. And the question is, is something changing. Here's the population change. Not, not good, right? Population's going down. That's not a good thing, but here's the migration, okay? And we have to get 2015s and 16s numbers on here. I realize that we hadn't updated this. Uh, but the green line is inbound. The black line is outbound. So exodus, exodus, exodus. Wait a second. What's happening here, right? Around 2014, it actually started evening out for some reason. The inbound and outbound were matching. And what you're going to see when we update this is the green line is going to overtake. Okay, the unemployment rate was historically higher, but it's coming down to meet the state average. And then job diversity. This is always a really important one also. This gives you a chance to see the pie of all payrolls, all jobs, what businesses are they in. Trade, transportation is one. Education and health is two. Professional and business is three. Manufacturing is four. And government is five. You want to see government not in the top three. Okay. And you might have thought that Detroit would have, a, would have a bigger government presence because it has a lot of poverty and not the case, okay? Manufacturing now is going to make its way up. So you see this chart in a year or two, this manufacturing number is probably back to number one again, 
right? I love this portfolio now because it's in a resurging city at a yield that you cannot touch. I mean, 18 and a half gross yield, 13.6 net yield. You put a piece of debt on this, like if you change your down payment to just be like 30% and you get a mortgage, your cash on cash return is 22, right? So Detroit's on a comeback and the reason is because factories are coming in and factories don't come in and then another president gets elected in three years or seven and they just shut all the factories down. That's not going to happen. These are long-term commitments they make and it's going to last a while once they actually set up shop. All right, so that's Detroit. That was the first thing I wanted to share with you. The second one was uh, Atlanta. We have had a phenomenal run of late of bringing on new portfolios in Atlanta. Atlanta's story is actually simpler. Atlanta has been the great southern city in the U.S., sucking population from everywhere for 30, 40 years. Okay? But when the housing boom came, let me just pick the, the top one here. We got five new portfolios in the last two weeks in Atlanta because we've been trying and concentrating there and people are responsive. So if I go down to that same chart, so here's the U.S. again. Here's the black line is the state of Georgia. So you can draw conclusions there. It was, it was tracking, and it wasn't even really participating as much. Well, I'll focus on the green line because that's the county where most of this portfolio is. So again, tracking with the country, all right? And what happened there was so much froth in the home building business. A number of things happened, but the one that I think was the most substantial and the reason why it took a nosedive and has taken this much longer to catch back up and it hasn't yet caught up. I don't want any of our sellers seeing this because they may change their mind on selling. But uh, they're leaving some meat on the bone here for the buyers because, again, you, take, you track the trajectory of what the market was doing when things were normal because things are getting back to normal. And you draw that line across, that leaves you someplace around here. All right, so you've got an opportunity in – uh, Atlanta because the fundamentals were mass migration to this major southern city population center right all the jobs all the schools everything you could possibly need major multi-million population city but they overbuilt and the overbuilding during the boom times you don't see it reflected here because what actually happened was there was so much new supply that flooded the market in the single-family housing market the subdivisions everywhere everywhere uh, that when the music stopped, they not only had a market that um, that was going to go into decline along with everybody else in the foreclosure crisis, they had a shitload of new inventory that nobody wanted. So that inventory actually stunted. Like you would expect this, this market to behave like the Florida markets, right, where it shot up and then came back down again. But it didn't shoot up, and the reason why was oversupply. So even though the market was frothing, the prices weren't tracking the same way as they were in other frothing markets in the south because they were hitting with so much new inventory. And then all of a sudden, those subdivisions went flat, and the market nosedived. And look at the beauty in this arc right here. Just, it's so natural. I love to see things like that. It's almost like physics is at work, that the market just kind of bowed and came back up again. And I'm telling you right now, it's got room to grow. Until it gets onto this line, it's not going to stop appreciating. So I think we're going to go from a median price of just over 150 to a median price north of 200, and I think it's going to happen in the next 24 months to 30 months, All right? And so these portfolios are available at yields that are in the mid sixes, maybe even low sevens, low sixes. Uh, but I think you're going to see appreciation not at the 2.4 percent level, which is what it's been for the last 20 years. You're going to see it at six and seven percent a year for a couple of years, not too much longer, just a few years. But what happens when you put down 30% on the portfolio and the portfolio appreciates 12 to 15% over three years? Okay, your equity just increased by 50% in a, um, in a very short period of time. Okay, so the play on Atlanta is the great population magnet of Atlanta has basically finally healed but it, it isn't, um, it isn't, it's fully healed, but it's not fully realized yet. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? Can I get a little high five if this was a, a good way to approach today's conversation? Yeah, cool. All right. So next week, we're going to start bringing people on here. We're starting with Jacksonville, Florida. We've got some friends down there 
from Jacksonville Wealth Builders, which is a real estate investment firm that's been um, doing great things down there and enjoying a market that has some really phenomenal fundamentals. I uh, interviewed them on my, on my radio show up in New York back in 2012, and we made a bunch of predictions about what was going to happen in Jacksonville uh, over the next five years. Well, we find ourselves five years later, so we're going to bring them back onto this show and uh, and have a conversation with them about that market. And I'm going to do that each time. We're going to share a portfolio, let you see the yields, let you see the type of assets, uh, let you see the fundamentals. And over time, what this has done for me, I learned a lot about the U.S. real estate market when I was doing, I mentioned earlier in Pittsburgh, I was training, right? We were We were training real estate companies that had to be investment real estate companies and so I was all over the place doing this. We trained 4,000 people. And I, was, I always have a room with 75 or 100 people in there. And we would analyze properties that they had listed. That was part of the, of the training class. Is I would show them how to analyze one of their listings. So they would shout out an MLS number. I'd pull it up on the web. I'd do some calculations. I'd show them how to calculate yield on a real deal. And say, well, what do you know? Your market is a 7.24% yielding market, or at least that neighborhood is. Because we didn't look for steals. We look for move-in condition houses, market price, market rent, right? Face value. What is a face value yield in that school district? Do that in 60 different cities over a two-year period, and you start to get the hang of the way the market performs and the differences in geographies and market fundamentals. Where is the interplay between appreciation and yield, right? You already know that when yield is up, appreciation is usually down, and when yield is down, appreciation is usually up, that little seesaw is part of what's beautiful about this asset class because, well, you can buy some Detroit and get some uh, crazy high yield, and then you can go buy some Southern California and get a, a crappy yield, but get crazy high, or forget California, let's say D.C., you know, Charleston, South Carolina. You can get um, a 3% yield, but a 6% appreciation, and then you get a 12% yield and a 0% appreciation, and your blended return is pretty darn good, but you've got you're playing two different trends. You know, you're playing the auto industry resurgence, and if you did DC, you're doing the, you're betting on DC continuing to grow because it's the seat of power in the solar system, right? So we're going to do Jacksonville next week. I think we're going to probably pick another city to do next week also, and we will continue to um, to highlight different parts of the country this way and uh, kind of try to build everybody's collective knowledge base. So I'd be happy to hear from anybody who wanted to suggest uh, a market for us to do live. If you happen to be an investor that owns property, the surest way for us to profile your market is to list your portfolio, and then we'll, we'll highlight your portfolio as part of the process. Okay? No questions today, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you for being here. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.